When Major League Baseball was in trouble because of the Black Sox scandal in 1919, the sport appointed a judge to be the new commissioner. It's one of myriad examples of how baseball and the law seem to walk hand in hand through the decades. With more on that connection, we welcome Paul Finkelman. He is the President William McKinley Distinguished Professor of Law and Public Policy and Senior Fellow in the Government Law Center at the Albany Law School in Albany, New York. And it's great to have you up here at TVO. It's fabulous to be here in Canada. And what's the story with that tie, first of all? This tie is yeah. a bunch of baseballs. I see I, that. I, you know, you have to wear the appropriate prop for the appropriate <laughs> venue. That seems appropriate okay. for our subject today. That's right. You have, the reason we want to jump here is, of course, we're in the middle of baseball season. And uh, you've written a couple of like scholarly papers on baseball That's right. That's right. over the last decade on how baseball and the law seem to walk hand in hand. So make the case, if you would, for example. Well, for example, uh, you imagine three umpires. They're talking about what they do. The first one says, I call them as I see them. The second one says, I call them as they are. The third one says, they ain't nothing till I call them. <laughs> if we're in the States, I would say, if you can understand that, you can understand how Justice Scalia and Justice Kagan can sit on the same court. Uh, another thing to think about is the strike zone. Strike zone is, in theory, from the armpits to the knees. If every major league umpire called armpits to the knees strikes, you'd have infinite numbers of 15 inning games, one to nothing, because the pitcher would strike most people out. No umpire calls the rule. But at the same time, Major League Baseball won't change the rule because that's kind of like amending the Constitution. It's a really big deal. So instead, the umpires do what we would call in constitutional law having a living constitution, what English, Canadian, American would call the common law of baseball. So each judge has his own notion, each umpire has his own notion of what the strike zone is. I'll give you one quick example. Yeah. You'll see a very good hitter take a called strike and he turns around and looks at the umpire. He's not yelling at him, he's not chewing him out. He's saying, where was it? I just want to know where is your strike zone so I know where I'm supposed to swing. That's, in a sense, how the law works. Um, you know, policemen don't always pull you over for going one mile over the speed limit, but sometimes they can. So discretion. They, there's a lot of discretion, lot of discretion. in baseball. Uh, America is an incredibly litigious society, you won't mind my observing. Uh, it's our favorite sport. Is, is baseball, baseball as well? <laughs> is baseball as well a very litigious Well, it's operation? litigious when you watch the game. I, I mean, you see people argue with the umpire. Uh, I was watching a game the other night and there was a close call at third base. The manager's out there screaming at the umpire. Now, he doesn't actually expect the judge, the umpire, to change his ruling. He's arguing for the, he's trying to set a precedent for the next time there's a close call at third base. Uh, and every once in a while, of course, you get it changed. You know, you can appeal a called strike in baseball. You can appeal whether you went around, did you hold your bat back. You should explain that because okay, if a guy, okay, yeah, okay. go ahead. B batter starts to swing, gets part way through, and he pulls the bat back. Checks the swing. It. Checks called check swing. And the question is, in baseball, they say, did you break your wrist? Well, you're not talking about breaking the wrist bone. You're talking about the wrists breaking this this imaginary place, right? Because if you did, then it's a strike. And so, did he pull it back in time? The the great home run hitter Hank Aaron was amazing. You get old films of him. He would come so close and then, because he had such incredibly strong wrist, snap the bat back. And if the umpire behind home plate says, says strike, says, well, let's say if he says not a strike, can the catcher, the catcher can appeal. Yeah. But the more commonly, it's the other way. More commonly, the batter will be called strike and he'll appeal. And the, and, and the ump pyre who rules on it is the one who has the good view. So if it's a right-handed hitter, it's the first base umpire because he's got the view. And if it's a left-handed hitter, it's, it's the third base umpire. And you see in baseball games the umpire saying, nope, didn't go around, not a strike. Um, so basically you get a decision and you can appeal it just like in a courtroom. That's right. You don't do that in football. You don't do that in basketball. I'm not sure if you can do that in hockey. Um, it's, it's a very litigious game. The other thing you see in baseball, which you don't see in any of these other sports, the manager comes out to complain and he brings the rule book. <laughs> and you see him the pointing to the rule book. He's saying, he's not saying you missed the call. He's saying, you don't understand the rule. Let me, judge, let me explain to you what the rule is. But 99.9% .9 of the time when the umpire does come out of the dugout or the batter is unhappy with the calling of the balls and strikes, Nothing happens. You never, you almost never change the umpire's mind. You don't, so why bother? Well, because for one thing, you're 
making the claim for the next time it happens. You're telling the umpire, look, be really careful about calling these strikes on the outside corner of the plate because I think you're over the line. Occasionally you get a reversal. And of course the other thing is, as in a courtroom, this is entertainment, this is for show, this is drama. Uh, flamboyant uh, lawyer in the courtroom, flamboyant manager. By, by the way, you notice, uh, of course, as with a judge, if you physically come in contact with a judge, you know, you'd be in contempt of court. You've never seen that, have you? It doesn't happen. No. And if you by accident touch the umpire. I was watching the Yankee manager the other day, and he's arguing with the umpire like this. And why is he doing this? So he won't inadvertently get mad and touch the umpire. <laughs> I've seen some of them, in fact, flip their caps around so that even the bill of the hat that's when they're right. going that, at it won't do that's it. That's right. And, and there's a kind of a respect for umpires the way there is a respect for judges. I'll give you a, the sad example. This spring in Utah, there was a soccer referee who was killed by a player. Player didn't like the call, went up and cold cocked the uh, soccer referee, knocked him out, hit him in the temple, he died like a week or so later. You never hear of anybody attacking an umpire, even though the players are standing there with a lethal weapon in their hand, the bat. That is amazing, right? Yeah, they are. They, they, have, they have all the ammunition they need. Either a pitcher could certainly oh, throw yeah. a ball to, uh, and have an agreement with the catcher to let it go and hit the umpire flush, you or bet. a batter with a bat, and you, you never see that. No, there's this great respect for the rule of law in baseball. Hmm. And that, I think, is the real connection between American and Canadian law, Anglo-American, uh, Anglo Anglo-Canadian, Canadian-American law. It's all the kind of same legal system. The Brits don't understand baseball, so they play that other silly game that's it's like it's Cricket. the great-grandfather of baseball. But, but Canadians and Americans un understand this. You know what, you know, Ted Koppel, you remember Ted Koppel yeah, I do from remember. ABC News yeah. once upon a time? He's born in England. Yeah. And he always said, I, I, I never fully felt American because I never understood baseball. Well, there's something probably to that, eh? I think there is. Yeah. Uh, in the courtroom, if you act up too much, it's obstruction of justice, and they can punish you. You? Yep. Same thing in baseball? Uh, in certain ways, yeah. I mean, you get you see uh, managers get thrown out of the game. You see coaches get thrown out of the game. You see players get thrown out of the game. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, there is this kind of, we will accept so much and only so much, and then you're out of here. And there's a level of decorum that you may not go over. And sometimes, you know, you see a manager get thrown out, they're purposely going over that level of decorum because they want to stimulate their team, they want to shake things up. Hmm. They're not going to win this game unless the team responds. Maybe if I get thrown out, the team will respond. So they're, they're trying to get thrown out of the game in that case. They are. But no lawyer tries to purposely get thrown out of the court or be found to be in contempt of court just to impress his client. Does that happen? Not usually. No. Occasionally so. in a highly politicized case. Lawyers will go almost to the edge or over the edge, hmm. but it's rare. It's, it's unusual. We now, don't have that many political cases. I know in baseball, one of the rules is, I don't know if it's a written rule, but it's certainly an unwritten rule, you cannot argue balls and strikes. If you're the batter and you don't like the way the umpire's calling it, you can't argue balls and strikes because they can throw you out of the game. Do you have a similar thing in the courtroom where, regardless of how bad you think the judge is being, you cannot argue this with them or else. I don't think so. I can't think of anything but either. But of course, the, um, the judge can, I almost said the umpire, the mm. judge can say, I'll take it under advisement. And at that point, it's time for you to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and as we know, the umps make their own decisions based on whatever the heck they want. And maybe judges do too. I don't think the umps do that. I mean, I think the umps make their decisions based on what the rules of the game are. Uh, what I find most amazing about the increasing use of technology where you have replays of, of close calls is how often the umps are right. How often they get it right. Yeah, they get it right. I, I mean, these are split-second decisions, and uh, you're just amazed. And when they don't get it right or when you don't think they get it right, it's often a film where it's even ambiguous. Hmm. Let's talk about respect. Yeah. I think in this country, I think most people have a healthy respect for the dignity of the judiciary. We do. You do in, in the United States. We, we do in, in the US North America, well. Canada, and the United States. OK. How about, again, if we're making comparisons between the law and baseball, what is the level of respect for umpires like at, at this moment in, in baseball history? I think the level of respect for umpires is very high. 
even when the fans were saying, kill the ump, and, you know, go get glasses, and the ump umpire's blind, you yell at the ump, but the reality is that everybody understands that the umpires work very hard, and they do a pretty good job. Now, there's a very big difference between, say, football umpire, referees and umpires in the U.S. and baseball, and that is the baseball umpires go to intense schooling, and then they got to work their way up from the minor leagues. Well, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job. A football uh, referee is not a full-time job. And many of them are awful. They're yeah. terrible. And you have scandals. because well, they do it once a week. That's right. And then you had in the NBA a couple of years ago, you had referees who were throwing games, fixing games. Oh, one guy did it. Yeah. yeah. You've that's never right. had that in American baseball uh, from the umpires. I you had it from right. the Black Sox, maybe. Yeah. But, but not from the umpires. And the umpires are very well schooled. They're very well trained. Just like it's really pretty unusual to find corrupt judges in America. But we they can see, find some. Uh, I think it's my impression that baseball umpires today have the shortest fuses they have ever had. And they just, remember back in the old days, Billy Martin used to kick dirt on the umpires. Lou Pinelli used to get right in their faces, Earl Weaver, scream at them. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, you look at an umpire sideways, he's going to throw you out of the game. I, I, there's, there's, they've got shorter fuses, I think, now than ever, and maybe, maybe judges in uh, in courtrooms do too. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think uh, if we wanted to test that, we could do the empirical evidence. We could do game films <laughs> of, of how long did it take to get thrown out. That'd be a great, uh, that'd be a great study for one of the uh, cybermetric guys in baseball. You know, how many, how many seconds do you have to yell at the umpire before you get thrown out? I don't know. I, I think don't know it's less. They, I don't know if they have a shorter fuse or not. I want to ask you about something that I read in one of your papers. Okay. How is the infield fly rule like anti-fraud legislation? Okay. Well, first you got to understand what the infield fly rule is, right. which is terribly complicated. Very complex, but uh -huh. you can do this. Okay. I hope so. No. Okay. The infield fly rule goes into effect when there are two or three men on base and there is a fly ball hit into the infield or into a place where an infielder could catch it, which would mean the sort of short outfield, because there was a controversy last year about yeah. a, a ball in the short outfield. Keep it simple, Prof. Uh, okay. Yeah. Fly less, ball, less than two outs. Fly ball to, 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 to an infielder, less than two outs, two men on base, or right. three. Okay. If the guy who's fielding the ball intentionally dropped the ball, first you have to remember, if you run on a fly ball and the ball's caught, you can throw to the base and, and you're, you're yeah. also out, doubled up, right? Or tripled up, right? So you've got men on first and second, they both run, the ball is caught, throws to second, gets the guy out, throws to first, triple play, right? <laughs> if the fielder intentionally dropped the ball and the runners haven't run because they expect him to catch it, then the fielder, if you've got men on first and second, he throws to third, gets the guy on second out, throws to second, gets... The, the guy on first out, double play, and the, the runner, meanwhile, of course, gets to first base and is safe. The batter. This is, yeah, the batter, the batter. This is why, by the way, it only counts when there are two men on base, because if you intentionally drop the ball and there's a guy on first base, what would happen is you'd drop the ball, you'd throw it and get the guy out at second, and meanwhile, the batter would have safely made it to first. So you couldn't you know what's great about this? Double play. People who don't follow baseball have no idea what you're saying right absolutely now. Absolutely not. People who do follow baseball are absolutely on top of every nuance of what you just said. Okay, say. and so it's anti-fraud <laughs> yes. because it prevents the infielder from fraudulently, play, fraudulently playing the game to trick the runners on base. That's the point. That's the point because they because they now know you get a fly ball in the infield and the umpire rules infield fly rule, which means the batter is out. Guy doesn't even have to catch the ball. He doesn't even have to catch the ball. The batter is out, and therefore the runners do not have to run to the next base because there's nobody pushing them along from base to base. So it's protection for the poor consumer who holds the bat and the runners on base. It's and it makes the game more honest makes the game more honest. It makes the game more honest. And that's, that's the point. However, yes. stealing in baseball is encouraged. Oh, but it's not stealing. Well, wait a second. If you're on first base and the batter doesn't hit the ball, you can steal second base. That's right. But it's not so that's stealing. stealing. That's not stealing. It's simply occupying unoccupied land in English law. <laughs> in, okay, what? In, in, in old English law. In, in, <laughs> In old, old English law, they had a rule called adverse possession. Adverse possession. Adverse possession okay. says, and you, you learn this in the first year of property law, adverse possession is basically 
you own a piece of land, you're not minding your land, you're off in England and you got this farm up in northern England, so you're off in London and you got this farm up in northern England, and you don't own it, you don't farm it, I move on it, and I, somebody says, you know, it's Pagan's land, I don't care if it's Pagan's land, I'm farming on it. And in old English law, if you farmed the land, if you lived on the land openly and notoriously for 21 years, it would become your land. Now, adverse possession makes a great deal of sense in a country that's devastated by things like the Black Death. And we don't actually know who owns the land anymore. So if you move on to somebody's land who may be dead, you occupy it for 21 years, it's your land. It still takes place in Canada and the US. I once bought a piece of property, there was a fence here, and when I did the, uh, got the property survey, it turned out my land was, my, the land, my land ended here, but my neighbor put his fence here. So I was adversely possessing like two feet of land <laughs> that belonged to my neighbor. It was a bunch of woods, nobody cared. But I always use that as an example because had I lived in that house for 21 years, and, I, and when anybody said, where does your land go? I said, my land goes to the fence. And when I bought the house, I said, your land goes to the fence. So I'm adversely possessing. So here's the thing in baseball. You have this vacant second base. You're not minding it. You're not putting a fence around your second base. You're not planting your second base. And I come along and say, hey, vacant second base. I'm going to take it. Similarly. What do you mean similarly? That's similar, a totally corrupt analogy. That's similar, ridiculous. Similarly. It's stealing. The, the other analogy is this. <laughs> I'm on first base, and I'm leading off first base. Mm -hmm. I'm legitimately on first base, but I'm not legitimately on your base path. I'm trespassing on your base path, and the pitcher sees me, and the pitcher quickly throws to you, and you put me out. Why? Because I was trespassing on your land. As the oh. runner, I'm only entitled to be on a base. I'm not entitled to be on this. So I can go from base to base, because all the bases are mine if I can get to them, but the, the, the base path, is yours, and if I trespass on your base pass and, and get thrown out, that's trespass. If I steal your base, it's adverse possession. <laughs> I have some respect for the former. I have no respect for that. Well, you got to take first year law school, then you don't. You're right. I never did do that. However, there is this expression in baseball: if you're not cheating, you're not trying. So they encourage cheating in baseball. Well, yes and no. I, I mean, I, I yes don't and yes. I, no, well, yes and no, because, <laughs> because I don't think. Uh, most players actually cheat. I, I mean, very few players throw spitballs anymore, which is the, you know, the most tor notorious example of, of cheating. You, what, you, I think, what I think you see in baseball most of the time, actually, is not cheating, but incredibly creative use of the rules. And my favorite example of that is Mr. October, Reggie Jackson. And you mm -hmm. re may remember a World Series game in which Reggie Jackson is on first base. There is a ground ball to the shortstop. He throws to the second baseman. Reggie Jackson is running towards second base. Reggie is now out. The second, the, the second baseman then turns around to throw the first base, and Reggie sticks his hip out and hits the ball. I remember it well. Okay. Ball bounces into the outfield. The batter is safe on first base. The other team manager comes screaming out, screaming, 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 and they look at the rule. And what does the rule say? The rule says that if you intentionally interfere with a ball being thrown, you are out. But Reggie was already out. <laughs> and so Reggie <laughs> creatively <laughs> and brilliantly understood the rule. And so he st stuck his hip out, bounced the ball, and all they could do is say, Reggie, you're out. And he said, well, I was already out. So it really doesn't matter. Very clever. That's a very clever use yeah. of the rules. Now, I don't, what I need to check on is whether they ever changed that rule, because there ought to be some penalty for it. That is very but there clever. Wasn't. Uh, but back on that issue of if you're not cheating, you're not really trying, you know, None of my baseball, coaches ever told me that. Well, baseball, you, you may be aware, just went through what they called the steroid era, where yeah. there was plenty of people trying to cheat in well, order to... Ass assuming you think taking steroids is cheating. Well, I guess you're going to tell me technically it wasn't against the rules, right? Well, if, when Mark McGuire allegedly did it, uh, well, he didn't allegedly do it. He did it. He fessed up to it. Well, what he fessed up to doing was, was using Andro. Andro, which was an over-the-counter drug that anybody could buy. It wasn't illegal to buy it. There was no rule in baseball against taking it, and he took it. Uh, he fessed up to taking aspirin, fessed up, fessed up to taking Pepto-Bismol, fessed up to taking lots of things that you could buy over-the-counter, perfectly legal, unregulated. You didn't need a prescription. Um, that's not cheating at the time that he did it. Um, I mean, we have this weird notion about what we don't like. What's the largest drug use in the history of baseball? Not steroids? No, of what? course not. It was speed. 
amphetamines taken by almost all players in the 1940s, 50s, and well into mm. the 60s. All players talk about taking reds and greenies. They talk about there were bowls of them. Right. And of course, this is something that Americans learned during World War II because we gave our bomber pilot crews uh, amphetamines when they would bomb Germany. They'd fly from London to Berlin and back. Uh, it's a long flight both ways. They'd be popping amphetamines. Baseball players, that's how they got through those 154 hmm. game seasons in the 1950s So is when you're taking trains all the way across the country. Is this to say you are not troubled by baseball's dalliance with steroids for all those years? Um, I'm far more troubled about America's hypocrisy over it. Uh, is there anybody who didn't think that Barry Bonds was juicing? Barry Bonds grew a full inch in his 30s. His hat size went up two sizes. <laughs> You know, if I'd been the owner of the Giants, I would have gone to the trainer and said, is there something wrong with our guy, Barry, our great player? He's, he's suddenly growing. I've never seen a guy in his 30s grow a couple of inches. Uh, America loved steroids until we had it slammed in our face. Oh, these guys are juicing. Um, you know, we live in a performance enhancement world, and I think we have to come to terms with that. Um, you want to say, well, nobody should be in the Hall of Fame for illegal drug use? You want to apply that to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? There'd <laughs> no, be nobody there. But that's all about expectations. Everybody but, expects rock and rollers to be doing drugs. I see. And, and you don't but expect base, baseball no, players. No, you expect baseball. You, you expect, a, a, apropos our conversation here, you expect baseball players to live up to the integrity and the spirit of the game and the rules. So, so uh, when, I, when Babe Ruth was illegally drinking openly during Prohibition, people didn't expect him to do that because he was breaking the I law? I don't think alcohol is a performance-enhancing drug. If anything, that ought to... It depends. Ruin your performance. In the 1950s and early 60s, there was a pitcher named Ryan Dern who pitched for the Yankees. Ryan Dern had Coke bottle glasses like this thick. Mm -hmm. Ryan Dern would come in as a relief pitcher. First five or six balls would sail over the catcher's head at about 90 miles an hour. He'd, he'd throw one into the dugout. Mm -hmm. Ryan Dern was known as a guy with a 90 mile an hour ball he couldn't control. And everybody in baseball knew that Ryan Dern was in the, in the bullpen drinking all afternoon. Hmm. So are you going to dig in against a guy who's drunk right. you don't and know where throw it's going. in a 90 an hour? No. So he, in fact, was using alcohol to enhance his performance because his, the batters were scared to death of the guy. Um, and you know what? I think I th I'm, I'm trying to hit the recesses of my memory banks here. I'm pretty sure David Wells pitched a no-hitter or maybe even a perfect game having been hammered. And I think Doc Ellis pitched a no-hitter no on, LSD. on LSD. And he admits right. that he pitched a no-hitter yeah. on LSD. So, yeah. So, the, and he so said okay, the I'm going to have to take that back. And he said, uh, he said the hardest thing about pitching the no-hitter on LSD was he didn't know which ball to catch <laughs> when, it, when, the, when the catcher threw it back. Hmm. And there was another pitcher, and I can't remember his, which one, and I want to disparage somebody uh, who said he was called up and he was completely sober and he couldn't pitch at all and he had a call timeout claiming he needed to go to the bathroom. He said, I popped a couple of reds and then I got oh back. Oh my I, gosh. I, I could pitch. Um, I got a minute left here. Let's talk about this. You know, uh, uh, concluding again with baseball and the law. You remember in California they had this three strikes and you're out thing? Yeah. Meaning if you did three, I don't know, what was it? Felonies? felonies yeah. Three felonies, you'd go to jail for 25 years. Yeah. What did you think about... Or for life. For, yeah, okay. Three, three strikes for life, yeah. What did you think about um, politics using the nomenclature of baseball to push through uh, a public policy goal that a lot of people thought was kind of stupid? Well, I think it's obscene, if you want. And, of course, three strikes and you're out has proven to be a catastrophe because we've got the prisons filled with people. In many states, if you write a bad check, it's a felony. So we have some people in prison for life for writing cumulative checks that are worth about $200. They wrote three of them, though, and therefore it's three felonies. If they'd written one for $10,000, it would be one felony, and they wouldn't be in for life. I mean, the, the whole criminal justice system should not, should not borrow from baseball to justify bad policy. Gotcha. It's been great having you up here. It's been a wonderful time, and, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Toronto in, in the playoffs one of these years. <laughs> in other words, you don't think it's going to happen this year? I don't know. The season's <laughs> half over. Anything could happen. Anything could happen, and that's and also that's why the, we love and baseball. that's the beauty of baseball. Indeed. It ain't over till it's over. Who said that? I think you did because we're out of time. I'm pretty sure Yogi said it too. That's Paul Finkelman. He's the president of William McKinley Distinguished Professor of Law and Public Policy and Senior Fellow in the Government Law Center. 
Albany Law School. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.